Good evening, gentlemen. If you are watching this, it's because something has happened and either I have become ill or there was an issue with the recording or something of that nature and uh, we were, you were unable to see a live version of this lecture for whatever reason. So that being said, I apologize for that. And uh, without further ado, uh, we'll jump into it. In the days of the judges, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. When the last judge, Samuel, was old, the people called for him to give them a king, and he anointed Saul as that king. But Saul disobeyed the word of Yahweh, and Samuel said to him in 1 Samuel 15, You have rejected the word of Yahweh, and Yahweh has rejected you as king over Israel. And Samuel turned to leave. Saul caught the hem of his robe and it tore. Samuel said to him, Yahweh has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. And as the garment was torn, so the kingdom was torn from Saul. And there was a new king of the Jews, King David. And God promised David in 2 Samuel 7 that when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And David died and his son Solomon reigned in his place. The son of David would he be the king of the Jews that would be established forever? No, alas, Solomon loved many foreign women. And as he grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to Yahweh his God, as the heart of David his father had been. And Jeroboam the son of Nebat rebelled against the king. Here is the account of how he rebelled against the king. Jeroboam was on the way, his way was going out of Jerusalem, and Ahijah the prophet met him on the way, wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone in the country, and Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into twelve pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, Take ten pieces for yourself, for this is what Yahweh the God of Israel says. See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you ten of the twelve tribes because they have forsaken me and worshipped these foreign gods and not walked in obedience to me, nor done what is right in my eyes, nor kept my decrees and laws as David Solomon's father did. And so as the garment was torn, so the kingdom was torn from Solomon's hand. Yet the prophets foretold that one day the kingdom would be reunited and ruled by one king, the son of David. And so, though they were exiled from their land, as we saw last year, they returned. And for centuries, they looked for the one who would come from David's line to shepherd his people Israel. The one who would be called the king of the Jews. I'm calling this lecture Mission Accomplished. I have two divisions. The first is titled The King of the Jews, and it covers John chapter 19, verses 17 through 25. Open your Bibles with me to John chapter 19, beginning in verse 17. And as we do, we recall from last week that Pilate has handed Jesus over to be crucified. Carrying his own cross, he went out of the city. The Mosaic law required that executions take place outside of the city, and the Romans were happy to oblige, setting up crucified victims at major traffic areas so that all could see the consequences of fighting against the Roman government. Yet our text interestingly says that he went out. And the reason that's interesting is that it was common for those who were going to be crucified to be pushed to the brink of mental insanity as the terrible fate approached. They often had to be herded like cattle. Not so with Jesus. Just as Isaiah 53 foretold, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led 
like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. In this, remember that it was not only those who were executed that were led outside the city. No. For Leviticus chapter 4, speaking of the sin offering, says that it must be taken outside the camp after it has been offered. And in the same manner, the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement will be taken outside the camp. Leviticus 16 verse 27. And so Hebrews 13 says, The high priest carries the blood of the animals into the holy place, most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Just as Isaiah 53 had said, he was led as a sheep slaughter. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. This is something we that's not commonly understood in understanding Jesus as the fulfillment of Scripture. I heard someone make the comment recently that Christians would get a lot farther in their understanding of the Bible if they started reading it as if it were fiction rather than nonfiction. Let me explain what he meant. When we read nonfiction, such as a historical document or a biography, we don't tend to see many of the details as important. It doesn't really matter where Thomas Edison was born, for example, outside of maybe providing a context for his life growing up. But when we read fiction, we are trained to see literary devices, such as foreshadowing. A character will make a statement or do something strange, and we will look at it and understand that it's going to be relevant later on in the novel when something similar happens. For example, in Genesis 22, when Abraham was going to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, it tells us that Isaac carried the wood for the sacrifice, just as we see Jesus carrying the wood for his sacrifice in our text. The Bible, in this sense, is like fiction. These seemingly insignificant details matter, and yet we know that it is nonfiction, that it is true. And all of this just points to God being its true author. It's not just that Jesus fulfilled explicit prophecies about the Messiah. It is that he also fulfilled patterns of the Old Testament, such as the sin offering being taken outside the camp. In verse 18, then, we see another pattern continuing to be fulfilled, namely that of David. We have already seen this pattern of David being followed back in chapter 13, verse 18, where Jesus says, This is to fulfill the, this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Speaking of the betrayal of Judas. When we were studying that lesson, one of you actually came up to me and asked me, How can that be speaking of Jesus if in verse 4 of that psalm it says that he has sinned against God? That's a great question. And the answer is, because David, in that psalm, is not explicitly writing prophecy. He is describing his own experience. And in verse 9, the one that Jesus quotes, he is referring to the betrayal of his close counselor, Ahithophel, who rebelled along with his son Absalom. You can read that account in 2 Samuel. And yet Jesus as the son of David, fulfills this pattern when Jesus does the same, when Judas rather does the same to him. Why are we going down this rabbit trail? Because Jesus fulfills other patterns in this way as well. As we move to the cross in verse 18 of our text, it says that they crucified him between two others. Let's look at selected verses from Psalm 22, another psalm of David, now. It opens with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
If you remember our study of Matthew two years ago, you may recall that that was a statement that Jesus said on the cross as well. And then it says, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in Yahweh, they say. Let Yahweh rescue him. Matthew 27, speaking of the crucifixion, says those who passed by hurled insults at, them, at him, shaking their heads. And further down, the chief priests say, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him. That's very interesting. We've read that before, right? Back to Psalm 22 now. I am poured out like water. Come back next week. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It has melted within me. We're not going to examine all the fine details of death by crucifixion tonight, but rest assured that these details match, and you can check them out on the internet. And here we see David going beyond his personal experience, speaking of something. Continuing, my mouth is dried up like a pot's herd, and my uh, tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All of my bones are on display. Remember, he had just been scourged. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Now, verse 21 is very interesting. Because if we would read the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, rather than the Hebrew, we would read, Deliver my soul from the sword, my monogene from the power of the dog. You know this word. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, God loved the world in this way, that he gave his monogene, his one and only son. Why is this significant? Because the Jewish translators of the Septuagint understood that David was speaking beyond his own experience to that of the son of David, who would come as their Messiah, the one who would be born king of the Jews. It was customary for someone being crucified to have a sign placed upon their cross indicating the crime of the individual so that those passing by would be able to read it. And being along the road on the Passover, it would have been seen by many people. We have already discussed how populated Jerusalem was at the time of the Passover. And Pilate had the sign written in Aramaic, the local language, Greek, the lingua franca of the world at this time, the language that everyone would have, would have been speaking, would have been able to speak, and Latin, the language of the Romans themselves. The goal is so that everyone could read this sign and know what the crime for which he was being crucified was. What was his crime? Why was this individual being subjected to the most horrifying torture and execution that humanity has ever invented? What was his crime? And the sign said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Mark it down. This was his crime. Jesus was not crucified for what he did. He was crucified for who he was. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Yet they have rejected him as their king and declared their allegiance to Caesar instead, as we saw last week. And so they go to Pilate and ask for the sign to be changed. But Pilate declares, what I have written, I have written. Let it be known for all time that the son of David had come as king of the Jews. And they crucified him. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, according to the custom of crucifixion, they divided his clothes into four shares. Yet there was one additional piece of clothing, his kitone, or his tunic. This is quite interesting, because the same word is used by the Jewish historian Josephus, who lived around the time of 70 AD. 
and to describe the seamless garment that was worn by the high priest at this time. Yeah, the soldiers remove Jesus' clothes and they find this article of clothing. This would not have been normal. And since it is seamless, to tear it would be to remove its value. So they cast lots for it in fulfillment of Psalm 22, which we have already read and is quoted here. But there's more to it than that. The beginning of the lecture, we read that Saul tore Samuel's garment, and it was symbolic of the kingdom being torn away from him. And then we read about how Ahijah tore his garment, and it was symbolic of Jeroboam tearing ten tribes away from Solomon. And if we were to read Matthew 26, the account of the night before our text, we would read that the high priest Caiaphas said to Jesus, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus responds by quoting Daniel 7, speaking of the Son of Man who would receive an eternal kingdom. You have said so, but I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then what did the high priest do? He tore his clothes. Because the kingdom was now taken away from them until they recognized Christ as their true king. Yet, when the soldiers came to Jesus' seamless tunic, they did not tear it. The son of David retains his kingdom, just as God promised to David in 2 Samuel 7, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. I will establish his kingdom. He is the one you will, who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. When humanity was created in the garden, Adam and his, Eve, Adam and his wife were both naked, and yet they felt no shame. It was only after the fall that they felt the need to cover themselves in shame. And God made them clothes out of animal skins to cover them. To cover their aim of nakedness, an animal had to be sacrificed. Their nakedness was their shame. But Hebrews 12 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. He took our shame upon himself when he was stripped naked so that we could be clothed in his righteousness as Isaiah 53 and 2 Corinthians 5.21 say. Just as in chapter 13, his clothes were removed as he humbled himself by washing his disciples' feet, so now his clothes are removed to be humbled to the point of death, even death on a cross for our sins. And so in our text, it says, therefore, this is what the soldiers did. Is it saying that they knew they were causing these prophecies to be fulfilled? Of course not. They had no idea. All of this was taking place because it was according to God's sovereign plan. The soldiers were merely the instruments by which the plan was carried out. Why are all these details recorded for us? John gives the reason in chapter 20. Jesus did many things that are not recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that he is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He died so that you would live, could live. The only question is, will you trust him? Will you recognize that he is the one who is sovereign over all and submit to your life to him, rather than living as if you are the only God that exists? My principle is this. Christ is the fulfillment of the scriptures. Christ is the fulfillment of the scriptures. My second division is titled, It is Finished, and it covers the remainder of our section down to verse 30. In contrast to the soldiers dividing his clothes among themselves, John mentions some women who are standing nearby. Matthew tells us that these were women that administered to Jesus and the disciples and provided things that they needed as they traveled. 
Perhaps they had even provided the clothes that the soldiers are now divvying up among themselves. There was nothing hindering anyone from coming up and approaching the cross. The sign was intended for maximum visibility, and historians tell us that people would have had conversations with those who were being crucified. Although it was pretty one -si usually pretty one-sided because crucifixion was death by suffocation. The effort to lift the crucified individual's head to breathe caused immense pain on either the feet or the arms where the nails were. All that to say is that the soldiers were merely there to ensure no one attempted to take him off the cross. As the firstborn, the responsibility for the care of his mother fell to Jesus after the assumed death of Joseph, who is not mentioned after the incident recorded in Luke when Jesus was 12 years old. Yet interestingly, he does not give responsibility for the care of his mother to, to his brother James, who would have assumed the role naturally. Instead, he sees the beloved disciple John and entrusts her care to him. The reason for this is likely because according to chapter 7, his brothers did not yet believe in him. Now, as for James himself, he would later become the leader of the Jerusalem church, the leading church in those day, early days, and would pen the book of James that we find in our Bibles. Nevertheless, from that moment, the disciple John took her into his own home. According to church tradition, she stayed with him until her death. Yet now, let us examine the suffering of our Lord. We have talked about how he bore our sin upon the cross. What does that entail? I cannot begin to tell you, but the implication seems to be that he bore the punishment of hell spiritually that was ours to suffer by right. In chapter 4, he had said that the one who drank of the water which he gave them would never thirst, and the water that he gave them would become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Yet in this moment, the source of living water is thirsty. As part of his suffering, that well is sapped. The eternal, infinite God was suffering the eternal, infinite punishment. Jesus had once told a parable in Luke 16 about two men, a rich man and a poor man. The poor man died and was carried to Abraham's side, but the rich man looked up when he was in Hades and saw the poor man with Abraham and called, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send him to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in this fire. This is the suffering of the king of the Jews, that he is buried for his subjects on the cross. And Jesus says that he is thirsty, just as Psalm 22 said he would be. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. And there was a jar of sour wine vinegar there. Earlier, some of the women, according to the other Gospels, had offered him wine mixed with myrrh on his way to the cross. That was an act of charity. These women would give those people who were on their way to, the, to be crucified this drink that was basically an act uh, that was basically a sedative to dull the excruciating pain that they were about to experience. And Jesus rejected that drink. He did not take the painkiller on the way to the cross. He suffered the full brunt of the agony. But this is not that drink. This sour wine vinegar laying near the cross had one purpose, to prolong the suffering of the individual as long as possible. We see this spoken of in another Psalm of David, where he says in Psalm 69, Scorn has broken my heart and left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They put call in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. People like to imagine that humanity is basically good. But mark it down. 
when God himself was suffering on their behalf and was dying and asked for a drink, they took a sponge full of vinegar and put it on his bloody, parched mouth. And David, foreseeing that in Psalm 69, just explodes. May the table set before them become a snare. May it become a retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Pour out your wrath on them. Let your fierce anger overtake them. May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. For they persecute those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt. Charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. This is their fate. Their just fate. And the fate of unbelieving humanity. For Hebrews 6 that says that the one who rejects Christ is crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. The offer of salvation is available to you, but if you reject it, then you take your place with those crucifying him, and you will share in the fate that David cursed you with, and worse. And for those of us who do believe, John 13 verse 1 had said that Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them, ice tell us, to the end. This verb we find in verse 30 is the same root as that, but in verbal form. And it is in the perfect tense, which denotes a completed action with continuing results. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it has been finished, or it has been completed, or it has been accomplished. Mission accomplished. The debt of his people has been paid. He has paid the penalty for their sins and accomplished their salvation. And with that, the synoptic gospels tell us that he screamed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's not humanly possible. Why do I say that? Because people who are about to die of suffocation which was what death by crucifixion was, can't scream. And yet that's what happened. This was so abnormal that according to Mark, it caused the Roman centurion who had witnessed countless crucifixions to conclude that Jesus was the Son of God. This doesn't happen with normal crucified victims. No. No. Jesus died on his own terms. He had said in chapter 10, eight, verse 18, that no one takes his life from him, but he lays it down of his own accord. He had authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. We'll cover that part in future weeks. And this is in keeping with the last verb, which is translated here, gave up his spirit. This is never used in Greek to express the thought of death. There were many ways to talk about people dying. This isn't one of them. This is unique. The verb here is paradidomai. It doesn't mean to give up. It means to give over. It's the word used to describe the betrayal of Judas in the other Gospels. Judas gave Jesus over to them. And it was used in verse 16 of our chapter to describe Pilate giving Jesus over to be crucified. So why does John use this strange way of speaking of Jesus' death? Well, let's go back to Isaiah 53, which speaks of Jesus as the suffering servant who was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities, which we've already examined in this lecture. Isaiah 53, verse 12, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So why does John use the word paradidomi to express the giving over of Jesus' spirit? Well, if we were to read the Greek translation of Isaiah 53, which was already in existence at the time of Jesus, we would read there, 
because he gave over his soul to death. Using that same word, paradidomy. John is pointing us back to Isaiah 53. Pointing to Jesus as that sin bearer for us. <laughs> One last thing to note. As we read of Jesus saying, it is finished, that our salvation has been accomplished, let us turn back to Psalm 22 one last time, the psalm that we have already referenced many times tonight. That began with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now go down to the end. Jesus, speaking of his greater son who would come, says, or David, rather, speaking of his greater son that would come, says, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. That his righteousness has been made available to us, that our salvation has been accomplished. He has done it. It is finished. The way of salvation has been made available through his work on the cross. Hebrews 10 says that we all have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for one time, one sacrifice for sins, for all time, one sacrifice for sins, his body, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made whole. My principle is this. Christ accomplished salvation for his people on the cross. So I ask you, will you put your trust in him? You have two options. You can put your trust in him and that he has accomplished the salvation for you. Or... You can reject that offer, and you can, as Hebrews says, take your stand with those crucifying who crucified him, and crucify him all over again and subject him to public disgrace. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and has treated the blood of the covenant as an unholy thing and has insulted the spirit of grace? Hebrews chapter 12. If you do so, then the curses that David pronounced will fall upon you. That is your choice. In the words of Moses, see, I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life so that you may live.